Hello everyone. Some of you might know me and some of you won't, and that's okay. I just wanted to make this video as a step-by-step -step guide on how to do big entries. This video is more targeted toward the intermediate drivers who are looking to hone in their skills and less of a how to drift beginner guide. This video is even more so directed toward the regulars who attend the Spirit JP events since a majority of the footage and demonstration is going to take place there for example. Doing big entries is definitely not something that's easy to accomplish and it requires a different level of commitment than you might be used to. A lot of folks are used to doing big sweeper style drifting which is very easy in comparison. Most of the time it's just a matter of getting up to speed, clutch kicking, and then holding that speed until it's time to transition. A lot of people aren't really used to the feeling of bleeding speed with angle in their car. I used to not really have a problem with this style of drifting when I first started because a lot of the local venues catered more toward this style. I definitely never thought I'd ever have a chance to do crazy entries outside of video games like R Factor and Assetto Corsa. Until I went to Japan. This was a life changing experience for me. But let's go back a little with some self introduction. I'll try to make this quick. I bought my car bone stock back in 2013 with the intention of it eventually being a drift car. At the time, drift events were few and far between and social media didn't quite have the presence it does now. This meant it was a lot harder to find events without knowing people who were already in the scene. I was fresh out of high school so it didn't affect me too much since I was broke, but I saved my money where I could and eventually had my car in a drift ready state. In the meantime, I decided to give a try at simulation drifting. So I picked up a Logitech G27, a copy of R Factor, and a handful of mods and tracks and began practicing. It took me about three weeks to figure out how to control the car, but I played pretty frequently once I learned the basics. Fast forward two years to 2015 and I finally met the right people to point me in the right direction for getting on track. There was a small group I can't quite remember the name of that hosted an event on the VIR skid pad. I packed up a handful of junk $30 used tires from my local used tire place, all my tools, and drove the car four hours there. This footage is actually from the very first event I ever attended. Um, you can tell that I didn't quite know what I was doing yet, but most of the stuff that I learned on R Factor translated directly into the real thing. It was just a matter of getting used to doing it in a real car. All of the hand and foot inputs were almost identical to everything I'd been practicing for a whole year prior to this point. Anyhow, I did three events this entire year. That's it. Just three. In 2016, I decided to do one more event at the end of the year, and then do a simple refresh over the winter on my car, since I was supposed to go on travel for work and make some extra money. You know, that simple refresh that takes two years to complete because you keep stockpiling parts and never installing them, and then changing your mind a couple times? Yeah, one of those. One thing led to another, and I found myself getting sent to Japan for a work trip in the spring of 2017. A buddy of mine who was already living there brought up the idea of buying a car for us to split to drive to Ebisu Circuit. Of course I agreed and we ended up with an R33 GTST. Here's how that experience went. <laughs> Yeah, it really wasn't that great, um, but I learned a lot. I didn't really get footage of me breaking the car, but we managed to fix it enough to drive home and then sold it. At this point, I wasn't quite ready to give up on drifting in Japan, and I was very eager to learn more. So two months later, when I came back, I bought a car through Power Vehicles. This is where the history with my R32 GTST begins. Now, the purpose of this introduction was to give perspective on how long it's taken me to reach the point I'm at now. It's been five years since I first clutch kicked a car, and I still have a ton more to learn. There's never an event where I go home 100% satisfied with the way I drove. I'm always looking to improve myself and my driving in the slightest of ways. You could say I'm a little hard on myself, but it helps me continue to grow and develop consistency and confidence behind the wheel to overstep my boundaries as a driver. <sighs> okay, now that the self-introduction is out of the way, let's go ahead and get into the rest of this video. I want to start off by stressing the importance of your car setup here. These techniques aren't going to work for everybody the same, and you need to at least have full confidence in how to control your car. If you want to pull this off at the same level I'm doing it at, you're definitely going to need some angle mods. It's doable with stock angle, but it's not ideal. You also need a pretty good consistent tire setup. I personally prefer running something that's balanced. This will let the front end float more on your deceleration without catching grip too early and spinning the rear around too fast. If you're trying to pull this off with sticky front tires and junkyard rears, it 
you're definitely not going to develop the consistency you need to do this comfortably. This doesn't mean you shouldn't do that, it's just if you're wondering why you're having a hard time pulling this off, it's because I run KR20As on all four corners. Doing this is definitely something that's highly debated between drivers. Uh, everybody's different. You're not going to like it if you're already used to running sticky fronts and not so sticky rears, but it definitely helps. Trust me. So unfortunately, I don't have much in-car footage of the early stages of learning this, but for the purposes of this video, I'm going to be using a Seto Corsa, for example, since some of the physics are close to real life, but they're not spot on. For starting off this style of entry, we're going to be going over using the clutch kick to initiate your car. This is an early stage to let you get a feel for how fast your car can snap to angle just by turning into the corner and using your clutch. Some of you might be thinking, But Tyler, why can't I use the e-brake? But we'll get to this later. Spend the time learning your car without the e-brake so that it doesn't hold you back from progressing. You want to start off by early shifting into third and placing your car toward the left side of the track. Find yourself a speed that's comfortable, say 50 miles per hour, and stick with that speed until you get this down consistently. Once you're comfortable getting this down at around 50 miles per hour, you can start stepping up the speed. The goal here is to turn in sharply and kick the clutch at the exact same time. This will start the rotation of your car and allow you to initiate into the turn. This needs to be a quick and fluid motion, but that doesn't mean to not let the revs get high enough. If you release your clutch too early or don't build enough RPM, the rear end of your car isn't going to slip the way it's meant to, and you'll end up getting understeer. After you've started your initiation your car reaches a desired amount of angle, you want to clutch in. Don't forget to remain heavy on throttle prior to this point. Knowing when to release the clutch is the tricky part. Releasing the clutch here is going to act as a second clutch kick. Make sure your RPMs don't fall and you're constantly giving it throttle blips while you're clutched in. Clutching in after your initiation is probably the most important part of doing this right. Something I see a lot of new guys do is clutch kick to initiate in, but then immediately take their feet off of all of the pedals. This will cause your wheels to start decelerating with the engine, the same way it would as if you were trying to downshift coming to a red light. Clutching in here is also important in case you reach a point of your car being beyond 90 degrees. Your drive shaft is still working against the momentum of your wheels. This will cause the car to behave in unpredictable ways. Remaining off of the clutch is also going to cause your car to suck into the turn instead of remaining deep like you should be. Leaving the clutch and is going to help you get your wheel speed back up faster by releasing it later once you have your RPMs up. To put everything I just said into perspective, here's an example of what happens when you try to initiate without depressing the clutch immediately after. You can see that the car starts to immediately suck into the inside line and put you in a really bad spot for the apex. Here it is again at a slower speed. Make sure to keep an eye on the pedal indicators at the top left for reference. Now with that knowledge dump out of the way, here's how this part should look once you get the hang of it, using the same speed and entry point as the previous clip. There's two more important factors of this before we move on to the next part of this entry, and that would be timing when to get back on throttle and how much brake is necessary depending on how much speed you're putting into the turn. We'll go over the throttle part of that first. Being able to use a seto for this example is actually pretty useful here because you can see where I'm looking as my reference point. You want to time it just right so that your wheels begin to pick up speed just before you hit your outer zone. This will help carry the momentum through the rest of the corner, as well as provide any additional deceleration you might need. You might be wondering what I mean by deceleration when you're on throttle, but by getting back on throttle, it's changing the direction your car wants to go. If you were previously going one way and then you're sideways and your throttle goes the other way, then you're, you're technically decelerating for that couple seconds. Unfortunately, just off screen, you can't really see what my pedals are doing anymore because I'm turning my head so much, but I'll try to compensate with that by playing some in-game audio so that you get an idea of my throttle timing. Make sure to take note of the fact that I'm keeping my RPMs up while the clutch is pressed in. So the last thing to discuss here is when to brake. This will be entirely dependent on how fast you're going, but in the example here I'm doing just shy of 60 miles per hour. Braking is going to do two key things for you here. Obviously the first one is slowing your car down, but the other one is going to be adding just a little bit more angle to your entry. Once you start reaching the point where you're doing consistently 60 plus miles per hour on the entry, you have to use your brakes, otherwise you're going to end up in the fence. Try to time your braking just after you get back on the clutch. You really only need to give it about quarter to half pressure since your car is going to be doing a lot of decelerating as it is. 
If you add too much brake, it could cause your front wheels to lock up and spin the rear around entirely. Here it is in slow motion. Notice that it is just a quick stab of the brakes. You don't need to hold it for too long. And that's really all there is to it. We can move on to the next part. For this part, I'll be using footage from me learning this myself in my R32. I actually have a few examples to show what not to do when trying feints. For the sake of learning this, let's try to forget using the clutch pedal to begin rotation so that you can learn how to use the car's weight to your advantage. This footage is also a good example because my R32 was on stock angle at the time. So while there's some subpar entries going on in the background, I'm going to explain some of the important key factors of doing feints. The most important part of doing a feint is throttle commitment. It's considerably harder to pull off doing a feint properly without your foot being to the floor. This doesn't necessarily mean to go balls to the wall in order to pull this off, but the moment that you turn in for your feint, your foot needs to be to the floor. This will help load the rear suspension so that when you let off of the throttle briefly to rotate the other direction, it helps sling that momentum back to the front of the wheels to pivot and then back to the rear once you get back on throttle. That might sound confusing, but it'll make more sense once I start explaining things. I know it's super cliche, but you really have to picture the the tofu delivery in the water bin and the direction the water moves and, and all that stuff in order to really comprehend what's going on here. Another important thing here is learning how to use the weight of your car instead of relying on power or relying on the handbrake to get your car to rotate. You really wanna avoid clutch kicking toward the wall when you start learning this. Using the clutch to begin your initiation is something that can be brought to your advantage once you get stickier tires or your car doesn't make enough power, but learn how to do it without relying on that first clutch kick. And this is why. So what you can take away from that example is that it causes the car to behave in unpredictable ways. It's also worth mentioning that at that time I was running Federal RSRRs on the front and ATR Sport 2s on the rear. Like an idiot. I was also on cold tires, but we'll ignore that at the fact that the front was considerably more biased for grip than the rear. Lastly, for key points here, is avoiding the e-brake. Like I said before, you really want to rely on the car's weight to get it to rotate instead of any of the other tools it has to offer. We will get into the e-brake later, but for now, ignore it. If you start using it, you're going to develop bad habits. The main purpose of this is to get you to rotate to angle as fast as your car can handle. If you have a good feint toward the wall, but then counter steer the other way and use the e-brake to get your rotation going, it's going to look a lot slower and way less aggressive than it should. That point where you're thinking you should normally be using the e-brake to get your car to rotate, if you're thinking that, that's where the clutch kick you learned earlier is going to come into play, but we'll get to that later. So with all the points out of the way there, I'll try to get into explaining how to do this and get a feel for it. So you're going to want to start off with slow sweeping movements. Try to develop a sense of feeling for the way your car reacts when you give it sharp steering input. You want to reach a point where your feint is just enough to where when you let go of the wheel, if you're confident enough for that, it should counter steer like that appropriately. If you're noticing that you get understeer during this point instead of minor oversteer, you should definitely play with your tire pressures or your damping settings. You want to reach a point where you hear your tires making noise as you turn in. It'll come from the rear, it shouldn't come from the front. If you do it just right, you'll notice that your steering wheel becomes briefly lighter and that's when you'll know when to let go and catch it at the appropriate timing. Knowing when to catch it is just a matter of how comfortable you are with your car placement in relevance to your surroundings. It's the same kind of feeling you get just before you're ready to transition on any other normal turn. Except in this scenario, you're going a lot faster and you just have to start slowing your car down before the turn ends. Take note of the sound that the tires are making right when I turn in. That example is more of an ideal scenario of how it should look once you've really gotten the hang of it. When you're ready to rotate, you might find it comfortable to briefly let off throttle to let that happen. When you rotate back the other direction, you might need to apply just a little more throttle to keep the car rotating, but after that it's just a matter of clutching in, letting the car float, and doing everything that you learned on the previous step. When I was looking through footage for this segment, I ended up coming across this clip that's a pretty good example of how things might look when you don't give enough steering input for your initial feint. Now 
Notice how much differently the car behaves. I didn't give enough steering input on the initial flick, and when I went to steer the other way with the same amount that I normally do, there wasn't enough momentum to get brought around to the front. So right there, I ended up having to rely on the e-brake to get the car to initiate into the turn. Another good example is here of me overcooking the car. Obviously the input I gave there was a little too much for this car with stock angle. Putting all of that together, here's how everything should look once you really gotten the hang of it and you have the right amount of steering and throttle input and you bring it back around to the front. Oh, wait, nope, oh, oh shit. Nope, that's okay. All right, oh, and okay, and our, uh, and we're under the ground. No, but really, um, faints do take some time to learn. It definitely is a matter of feel, but every car is different, every setup is different, every driver is different. It's just something you have to be fully committed to. So we're finally here. You're at the point where your clutch kick initiations by themselves are starting to get pretty aggressive. You've reached a point where your feints are really comfortable and consistent. Let's put those two together and make for a very aggressive entry. Now there's a lot going on with your car right here, so I'm going to do my best to explain exactly what's going on. The entry starts with a turn-in that's aggressive enough to break the rear wheels loose from steering input alone. Once the desired car position is met, I briefly push in the clutch and release the throttle. Doing this for that split second is allowing the weight to move from the rear of the car from acceleration toward the front of the car. When the weight is moved toward the front, it helps assist pivoting the weight of the rear on the front wheels which in turn begins your initial rotation. The very moment the car starts to rotate, I give a clutch kick to drastically raise the rear wheel speed enough to move all of the weight back to the rear of the car when throttle input is resumed. Once all of that weight that you're slinging around goes back to the rear, it helps push the rear of the car toward the front of the car and sometimes puts the rear ahead of the car. Doing the clutch kick is gonna obviously raise your rear wheel speed, but doing that also helps with there being less friction between the tires and the pavement. With less friction, there's more speed for the weight to move from the rear toward the front. I know that might not make the most sense and I might not be the best at explaining it, but if you break it down visually and think about it as the water in the tofu bucket, then it definitely helps with figuring that out. You can try to picture it like this, okay? Visualize yourself running full speed across a parking lot, and then suddenly you decide to change the direction that you're running in that parking lot. But at the moment you decide to change direction, you step on a patch of ice. The patch of ice here is going to be a clutch kick in this scenario, and your legs are the rear end of your car. In that case, that would probably make your upper body the front end of the car. So now that you've managed to visualize yourself busting your ass in a frozen parking lot, I'll try to break this down again. As you're coming up the straight, full throttle commitment is key. You turn in while remaining full throttle, briefly let off while clutching in, and then getting back on throttle as a clutch kick. As you can tell, it's a very, very quick movement. Let off, clutch in, clutch kick. Just like that. For the remainder of the turn, it's just a matter of knowing how much braking pressure to apply, when to release the clutch while simultaneously getting back on throttle, and then carrying yourself through the rest of the turn. Keep an eye on the car's weight here. When I'm on throttle, you can see it's leaned back. When I briefly let off, you can see it dip slightly. There's not too much else to explain during this part. Um, we've pretty much covered everything. If you've taken the steps in the right order, all of it should come together for you naturally. At this point, there's really only one other thing you can do, and that's just changing how aggressive you want your entry to be based on your steering input. If you decide to be aggressive with your initial faint turn in, you have to be prepared to be aggressive for the turn the other direction. These clips from a more recent event can really show you how aggressive you can get with your steering. The harder you turn, the faster you're going to get to angle. 
So despite that previous statement, I actually put these side by side to see if I could find a difference. And uh, either I'm just that consistent or it didn't make any difference, but I could also just not be steering in as hard as I think I am. Room for improvement. So that's pretty much it. It's really not as hard as it looks. Um, it's all about timing and full commitment and just constant practice of doing this over and over and over again. Once you've figured this out, there's so much more that you can do with your car. You can make your transition snappier. You can use the clutch to your advantage in chase positions. There's, there's the possibilities are endless at that point. I thought about using this example footage and comparing it to other entry methods that you might see a lot of other people using at Spirit, like clutch kicking toward the wall and then e-brake to rotate or, or even fainting, but then using the e-brake to rotate still and just using using the e-brake in general but i mean it kind of goes without saying that this is significantly faster to rotate than any of the other methods you can see and that's important because when you come in for competition at spirit events you're judged based on how fast you get to angle so you want to do it as fast as possible there's really no other way to do it as fast unless you just have a ton of horsepower and just rip your e-brake but just just don't be that guy. I just want to see every single driver out here driving like you see in all the Mayhem videos. And I think it'll be a bright future if we can get everybody to that level. Well, you did it. You made it to the end of my self-proclaimed instructional video. If you sat here through the last 20 minutes, um, I really appreciate you doing so because I put a lot of hard work into this and I hope somebody found it useful or learned something new from it or decided to look at things the way they didn't before. Even the advanced drivers out there who already thought they knew everything. Maybe you can take something away from this that you didn't already know. Overall, I'm just happy to help anybody progress and reach the next level of their driving. I was obviously there at one point and had to pretty much teach everything I know now to myself. I didn't really have anybody or a video like this to put me in the right direction. If you found this helpful and you want to see more, um, let me know because I actually had a lot of fun making this and I would not be opposed to making more videos like this for different techniques and skills and running the proper line or tandeming and stuff like that. So just keep in touch and uh, I'll see you guys around.